In the last video, I introduced some new terminology related to robotics. Links, joints, end effector, manipulator, workspace, and degrees of freedom. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about degrees of freedom, and we're going to look at some examples to show how we could pick how many degrees of freedom we want our robot manipulator to have. We're going to see in this video that most robot manipulators have either three degrees of freedom or six, and I'll show you some examples uh, to indicate why that is. In order to help illustrate the concepts of degrees of freedom as it relates to workspace, I'm going to build a, a little robot manipulator on my box here. A robot manipulator is just a series of links and joints. So for my example, I'm going to use some of my erector set pieces to, to build this manipulator. I'm going to use pieces like this for links, and I'm going to use these little plastic pieces for joints. So I'm going to start out by building a one degree of freedom robot manipulator on this box to show you what the workspace would be in this case. So here I have my very simplistic one degree of freedom manipulator. I can tell that it has only one degree of freedom because it has only one joint. And this joint is a revolute joint rather than a prismatic joint because it allows the joint to rotate rather than slide in a linear fashion. Now in this manipulator the end effector would be located right here at the end of the, um, the link. And what I want you to do is imagine in your head the space that this end effector traces out as I rotate this one degree of freedom manipulator throughout its entire 360 degree rotation. This space that the end effector traces out as I rotate the link is the is the manipulator's workspace. So in this case, the workspace of a one degree of freedom manipulator is a circle. In other words, the workspace is a one dimensional space. Next, let's take a look at a two degree of freedom manipulator. So here I've built a two degree of freedom manipulator. You can tell it has two degrees of freedom because it has two joints. And once again, both of these joints are revolute joints. Now, there's more than one way that you can build a two degree of freedom manipulator. This one that I've built here is called a two degree of freedom planar manipulator. It's called a planar manipulator because the end effector, when I move these two joints, it always moves in a plane. In other words, the end effector always remains on the same surface. Now, what I want you to do is, as I move this manipulator around, try to imagine in your head the path that the end effector sweeps out and see if you can figure out what the workspace is for this two degree of freedom planar manipulator. The way you figure that out is by first holding the first joint steady and rotating only the second joint. And picture the path that the end effector sweeps out. In this case, the end effector sweeps out a circle if I successfully hold this first joint constant. Now, I'm going to imagine that circle that the second joint sweeps out um, moving around in the path that the first joint sweeps out. So I'll have this circle from the sec or second joint moving around 
rotating around the first joint. And every space that this, or every location that this end effector can reach is a part of the workspace for this manipulator. The workspace for this two degree of freedom planar manipulator will look like a disk. I'm gonna show you a picture now to represent the uh, workspace of both a one degree of freedom and a two degree of freedom manipulator. And what you'll notice is that while the one degree of freedom manipulator has a one dimensional workspace, the two degree of freedom manipulator has a two dimensional workspace. Here I've shown a picture of a one degree of freedom manipulator. It's a single link free to rotate about its center joint. As it rotates, the end effector traces out a path that is a circle. This circle is a one dimensional shape. In other words, it has length but it does not have width or thickness. Here I've shown a picture of a two degree of freedom planar manipulator. The second link here is free to rotate about its joint, creating a circle. This entire circle is then free to rotate about the first joint, as so. so that the workspace of this manipulator is this entire area created by uh, or bound by these two lines. This space is a two-dimensional area because it has both uh, length and width or radius and angle. So the workspace of a one degree of freedom manipulator is one dimension, a circle. And the workspace of a two degree of freedom manipulator is two dimensions, a disk. So now you might be able to predict why it is that many robot manipulators have three degrees of freedom. You would expect that a three degree of freedom would have a workspace that is three-dimensional. Having a three-dimensional workspace is very useful since space consists of three dimensions, length, height, and width. I'm going to now show you an example of a three-dimensional manipulator. Here I've built a three degree of freedom manipulator. It has a joint right there, there, and a third one up here. This three degree of freedom manipulator allows rotation around its base like this. I've switched to more of an isometric view here so that you can see this a bit better. It can rotate about the base. It can rotate uh, in it. We call this the shoulder of the manipulator right there. And then we also have the elbow that can rotate here. If you imagine the space at the end effector of this manipulator traces out, you can see that this manipulator can reach points in a three-dimensional volume rather than simply a two-dimensional area as the two degree of freedom manipulator or simply a line as in the one degree of freedom manipulator. You might recognize this design uh, of manipulator from industrial equipment or even from your own arm. And there's a good reason for that. This is a, a useful manipulator design for being able to reach um, having a wide workspace. One final thing that I would like to point out in this video is that while it is true that it is required for us to have a at least three degrees of freedom in our manipulator in order for the manipulator to have a three-dimensional workspace. It is not true that 
every three-dimensional manipulator is has a three-dimensional um, workspace. In order to uh, show you an example of that, I've built here a manipulator that has three degrees of freedom, but its workspace is only two-dimensional. This is true because this is a three degree of freedom planar manipulator. All three of these joints in this manipulator have an axis of rotation that is parallel to the other ones. And so the end effector in this manipulator always moves in a plane. In order to build a three degree of freedom manipulator that has a three dimensional workspace, at least one of the joints has to have an axis of rotation that is perpendicular to the others. This kind of a manipulator that has more degrees of freedom than it has dimensions in its workspace has a particular term. It's called a kinematically redundant manipulator. A kinematically redundant manipulator is one that has more joints than are necessary or more degrees of freedom that, than are necessary in order to achieve its uh, dimensionality of workspace. So a two degree of freedom manipulator that has only a one dimensional workspace would be kinematically redundant. Or as shown in this case, a three degree of freedom manipulator that has a workspace that is only two dimensional is a kinematically redundant manipulator.